Gambling Neighborhood Nerds, it's your boy, Respawn, joined once again by Robo Strange and Judah Rad and a very, very special guest uh, for Dynamite. He's written Legendary, Vampirella, Twilight Zone, The Shadow, Doc Savage, Betty Page, Elvira, Mistress of the Dark. For American Mythology, he's written Zorro, Swords of Blood, and for Kevin Eastman Studios, Drawing Blood and the radically rearranged Ronan Ragdolls. What alliteration. Welcome to the show, <laughs> Mr. David Avaloni. How are you today? Hello. Thanks for having me. Well, that was, that's a lot of stuff. That's a lot. Yeah, that is a lot of stuff. Was, and it's only been since uh, 2014. What? Wow. Radi- I have radically rearranged Ronan Ragdolls. The radically rearranged Ronan Ragdolls. <laughs> I can do it. Uh, yeah, I've only been writing comics since 2014. Wow, that's awesome. That? Wow, that yeah. is awesome. Thanks. What were you doing cool. prior to that? Uh, making movies. Oh, is, nice. there, is there any crossover? In one way or another, I you can go to my uh, internet, internet movie database page and just see a whole bunch of crazy nonsense that I kept myself busy with for about 30 years. Before comics, oh, he's uh, legit. He has an IMDb page. Robo, Robo that's IMDb. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to fight you and, after this. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, no, I was, I was, I was doing stuff. I was, I produced some movies, directed some movies, made some things, but uh, got an opportunity to write comics and jumped on it. And then it kind of, two things happened at once. The last two projects I worked on were sort of, as movies, were kind of disasters. And then the uh, comics took off and I was getting a lot of uh, creative freedom Mm -hmm. making comics. And there's something really great, especially if you're with a publisher, about the, you write something and four months later, people were walking around with it in their hands. Uh, compared to you write a movie and then maybe 10 years later it gets made so uh, <laughs> it had that Unless going for it so you know <laughs> there was there was a lot there were a lot of good reasons to focus a little bit more on comics That's comics right. That's is right. the best Com- comics is literally the best because there's no limit on special effects like if they can draw it it can happen sure and though, and uh though, your cast I always, I always try to caution writers against saying that because while yes Anyone can draw anything. As someone who has made two artists draw traffic jams, <laughs> that's it. Yeah. That doesn't uh, yeah. mean they're happy about it. <laughs> right, right. I know. I know. If I ever write a book, there's going to be one in my script that's like, on this page, I need the camera to pan all the way out, zooming across the entire metropolis, millions of people right. swarming up. Each, I'm like, each I hate person you. unique. <laughs> each person unique. But, you know. The, the, <laughs> The thing that it actually has in common with the budgeting in movies, honestly, is mm-hmm. just like a movie, for every scene that you have a big scene that's going to kill you to film, you then have the scene of the two people sitting talking to each other. And, there it is. And there the, artist, is. Right. the artist gets to draw two close-ups, and the lighting guys get to light two people sitting at a restaurant, as opposed to, meanwhile, in the entire in the universe. Yeah. yeah. Right, right. You said you, that you uh sorry you said that you were in movies now you're writing comics like as far as the industry goes like what are, what would you say are like the biggest differences between the two as far as like deadlines or or is it the deadline you know? thing is pretty is pretty intense in comics I mean I've had deadlines in film but it's very uh a lot of things move at a snail pace which has and, more assholes uh, and yeah. yeah I'm I have yet to <laughs> meet an industry that has no, well that's no not true the music industry exists so that people in the film industry can feel good about themselves um, that's, that is <laughs> literally that is the worst in my oh, okay. in my as someone who worked on music videos for a few years m- my wife is a among other things a mm-hmm. union costumer mm. the slowest she has ever been paid in her life was working for musicians was wow. doing costumes for Kanye couldn't write a check for about six months. I don't know why I'm That's not awesome. surprised. Kanye, by that at all. yeah, <laughs> she literally you know, had you know to go. Like, do you, she literally had to go. Do you really want me to go on social media and say Kanye <laughs> won't fucking write me a check? Wow, uh, so. I, I, I'm sitting here ready to ask you what I would imagine was an uncomfortable question, like 
I was going to go, it's like, like who? Thinking, thinking, <laughs> like, yeah, like, you're like, not going to name names. I can't say. <laughs> and before I give you, like, fuck God. No, he, he didn't say, he didn't <laughs> say fuck God. No, there's no part of my career that is going to rely on the approval of Kanye. So I'm not. I'm nice. not he makes that one God. tweet. Wait, <laughs> one you've tweet. made it. You've made it. You're finally free. I have burned of Kanye. the Kanye bridge. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. Awesome. So, right. And also, P.S., would I work for someone who took six months to write a check? No, I would not. No. So there's that. Well, it depends hey. on the check. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's 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 just way off topic, but like you say that, but then like you open up uh, any Detective Comics or Batman, and Joker has this steady flow of henchmen that are willing to work with him. Yeah. So yeah, that the henchman you know. thing always cracks me up with that. Where do they get those guys? What do they? I do? have a theory. He's breeding Ooh. them. He's got to be. Ooh. Who's? Oh, Roy was into Ooh. it. <laughs> you want to work? <laughs> You want to work for the guy that'll arbitrarily like hit you over the head with a mallet. I just, yeah. I, I always think about those guys, especially in Bond movies, because they're just getting paid. They're just mercenaries. Mm-hmm. They don't believe. You don't even in. have a name tag. You so all the guys, all the guys at Spectre. I would just think the minute the place starts blowing up and Marines are invading and all yeah. that, they just go, "Hey, you know what? This was not in my contract. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> the hell, the hell with Blofeld. I'm yeah. just gonna go now. You guys." <laughs> Blow up the volcano base. I'm, I'm just yeah. like this is not covered in my overtime package. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I won't, I won't do space stuff. I won't jaws. Right. These are my lines. Yeah, exactly. What is Spectre's <laughs> dental? Spectre has incredible <laughs> dental, which is why right. every, everybody stays with Spectre because the dental is just amazing. amazing. Off the chain, yeah. yeah. I so, actually just got a question for you, but I want to ask: What's the weirdest shit that you've asked someone else to draw? Oh boy, what is a, that's a that is a really good question. The weirdest there was a four issue run of Elvira in Hell, wow, uh, which had some super weird stuff in it. Uh, I mean, I think any given issue of that had had. Weird, <laughs> I mean, and there's weird of like unsettling weird, and then there's just a crazy thing that you wouldn't think anyone would ever draw in a comic book. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've done you know, both. <laughs> yeah, I've, done, I've definitely done both. I mean, there's a, one of the the traffic jam in hell scene. It was the circle of the wrathful. If you know your Dante, and yeah. I had them as I played the game. Were, I played the game. Yeah, in, <laughs> people who were in a traffic jam, they were chained to their seats with barbed wire, oh, no. and to give it the 21st century twist. They had their their uh, smartphones on and facing them, and they were being roasted on Twitter, but they couldn't respond. Oh my god! Ooh, that's so nice. While they sit in traffic in hell. That's and where the David, Donald is. And and David yeah. Costa, David Costa <laughs> drew that, and he drew it very well and very clearly. Um, but also, Dave in, in that series in particular, Dave has my love of uh, deep, deep, ridiculous references. Uh, the villain in that series was uh faust and when faust. i when i suggest you know that who, there was a historical faust his character in a bunch of plays famous play uh and when i suggested that we were going to use faust as i was typing i want him to look like richard burton because richard burton made that really <laughs> terrible faust movie in the 1960s he literally as i was typing that he i am me a picture of richard burton from the movie going oh, so wow. this guy right and i went yes. oh, nice and <laughs> when you when you make all of these references, so we introduce him in the time travel story. Then we go to the Elvira in hell story. And I'm like, okay, so Faust is in hell. What is his hell? I'm like, well, he's Faust and he's also Richard Burton. And his hell was, he's in uh, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? And his Helen of Troy is Liz Taylor throwing, you know, cocktail <laughs> glasses at him and calling him worthwhile, calling him worthwhile and, you know, all of the insults oh from the play and all that that is i think that's the only edward alby reference in a dynamite comic ever i'd probably be gotta be for, uh, that's amazing. On that. when i suggested all that acosta was like are we putting out a syllabus with this or are people just gonna have to follow as best they can <laughs> you know but yeah that's some of the weirder stuff was probably in elvira in hell that's probably the weirder and also then the 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 arc after that, uh, some of it took place at essentially uh, medieval times in Orange County. <laughs> so that was also kind of nutty stuff to draw. 
<laughs> wow. That's so okay. fun. Love it. So uh, looking at your body of work, you got uh, The Shadow, Doc Savage, and I'm seeing Zorro there. I think the, uh, the like all that really leaves out is uh, The Phantom. Um, yeah. Yeah. I like, I think when I met Joe Ryband, who gave me my first job, which was the legendary Vampirella gig, um, I told him, you know, I knew at the time that they were doing all the pulp characters. And I said, not for nothing, even at my age, <sighs> I'm younger than most people who like really get the pulp characters because mm -hmm. my dad mm -hmm. was born in 1924 and grew up with those wow. pulp characters. And right. in the sixties and seventies, Bantam books reprinted the pulp novels. So we had a bunch of those in the house. So I had actually read them when I was That's a little awesome. bit So, you know, a lot of people, there are definitely people that Dynamite hired to write those characters who knew them coming and going. I'm, I bet anything Matt Wagner didn't need anyone to tell him about the shadow, <laughs> you know, like mm. that guy, that, that Matt's a genius and a fan and all of that stuff rolled into one. Uh, and I was in the same, like, I don't need to go to Wikipedia to go now who's the shadow. Who's that? <laughs> uh, so, you know, that it almost feels like you spend your lifetime being a nerd and then you get a gig where it's like, here, you were actually doing research for a job all those years that you were Hell reading. Yeah. There it is. That's my dream come true. Yeah. Um, Doc Savage is kind of like a proto <laughs> Superman, which oh, I think yeah. is kind of interesting. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, I, the only convention I've ever been a guest of honor at, when I was writing Doc Savage uh, Ring of Fire or shortly afterwards, there is a yearly Doc Savage con called Arizona what? Doc Con. Yep. Oh, my God. I'm doing I it have for to... 20 20, 30 years. And it's like 50 people in a hotel room. <laughs> Soon to be 51. Room. But it's, <laughs> it's, they're lovely guys. My wife, I think, the, my wife at the time was maybe 48 or 49, and she was absolutely the youngest person in the room, nice. like by a long, long time. Wow. Uh, but they were they're, they're really great bunch of people, and they brought me in as a guest of honor. Go, uh, great because go, I was the person I was the person doing uh, new new Doc Savage at the time, uh, but it's wow. uh, but there are still people carrying that. Oh, but and the reason I bring that up is one of the things I always when I talk about this stuff, and this goes to comic books even today. All of us nerds are doing something that we were never expected to do. When you bought Doc Savage for a nickel or a dime in 1933, you know what you're supposed to do with it. You were supposed to throw it in the garbage when you were done reading it, wow. just like you would any other magazine. That's why they were, were printed on that cheap ass paper. Yeah, pulp paper. That's that is it. where the word right. literally comes yep. from. It's pulp. Hmm. That's why I do my pulp podcast, which we'll talk about. But the people who loved them so much and put them in a you know mylar envelope and saved them all those years, they kept this crazy thing alive and. As much as Superman is absolutely, same thing with Batman in the Shadow, by the way, but Superman is absolutely someone looking at Doc Savage and going, there's an influence. I don't think there's an influence in the creation of Superman per se, but when they give him a name and it's Clark, like Clark Savage, mm. uh, and when the advertising calls him the Man of Steel. And there's a Fortress the of Solitude. Of, we've had the Man of Bronze. The Fortress of Solitude is, a, is an interesting example. That comes in in Superman, I think, in the 50s. Doesn't he, Superman doesn't have a fortress when they start out. That's right. And that's literally a Superman editor going, you know, I love those old, you know, it's the 50s. The Doc Savage pulp magazine has been out of print for a couple of years at this point. And it goes, it'd be kind of nice. Superman should have a, a Fortress of Solitude. I wouldn't even call it plagiarism. He thinks no one will ever remember that in a million years. And it's a little hat trick to wear. Surprise, surprise Doc isn't it. public domain yet. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of things that should be public domain that aren't. <laughs> and then there are right. things, and this, you know, I've said this before, and it could possibly get me in trouble with very nice people, but certain things that are public domain, there are companies that treat them like they're not public domain. Disney. Uh, uh, Disney. <laughs> The first Zorro novel is like from, Thor. Well, <laughs> Thor is, a, you know, absolutely the public domain, which is why anybody huh. wants to make a Thor comic book. But 
the first Zorro novel is from like 1919, 1909. John Carter is from 1914. Tarzan's from about that time. <clears throat> Sherlock Holmes. And there are companies that have copyrighted these things. Well, they've trademarked these things. But it's really, we've all just kind of agreed to let the Edgar Rice Burroughs people and the Zorro people and the Sherlock Holmes people pretend that they still own it because the only alternative is if you do your own John Carter, Sherlock Holmes thing, they'll come at you. Right. And they will be wrong and they will lose in court. But then you've got like, uh, I got into a fight with the Zorro Corporation while making my Zorro you know what? Why don't we just give the Zorro Corporation the two? Right. You know? right. But it's a, it's a funny kind of a fine line of like what people have decided to protect and what people have decided to go along with. And yeah, right. Bond, you know, Bond goes back to 53, so he's not not quite. And Fleming dies in. As, as long as Barbara's five. alive. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. It's, it's, it's tricky stuff, but, you know, and I have a. I see both sides of it because my father was a novelist and I own, you know, 80 novel copyrights of his work. Uh, so on the one hand, I'm like, why won't anybody let me write Jane Fonda novels? On the other hand, I'm like, well, no, you should. <laughs> so yeah. it goes, it goes a little bit both ways. But uh, are there any pulp heroes that you would like to write? Like any that haven't happened yet? You know who no one has revived and it's such a great character. Dynamite. I don't think they even bothered picking them up when they picked up all the pulp characters. There was a pulp character called G8. G8 and his battle aces. G8, it was supposed to be a World War I set. He's a secret agent, and he like, flies a biplane, fighter plane, and he fights the Kaiser, right? And it should be simple. But because it was the pulps, and I think under the influence of Doc Savage, it's very wild, wild west. Suddenly, mm. the Kaiser in 1917 has giant mutant bats that he's going to attack. There are dragons in that in that pulp. There are a lot like the Germans are constantly inventing these super weapons that didn't even invent exist in the 30s when they're writing the pulps. So it's this kind of like science fiction, but set in more. It's steampunk before anybody called anything steampunk. Sounds uh, great. And he's a great character. And I wrote a thing. I actually submitted it to Dynamite when they still had all the characters. Uh, when I was a kid, me and my dad were talking about how shitty Son of Kong is, the sequel to King Kong. <laughs> and we sat down and worked out a sequel to King Kong that would be good. It was called The Morning After Kong. And one of the gags, because we were writing it, knowing we would never own the rights to any of it, is it used all of the pulp heroes from the 30s. And the, and the way in was if you had a giant ape on top of the Empire State Building in 1933, you would call G8. Because G8's been shooting down dragons and giant bats and shit his whole career. Like, he's the guy. He's the guy you kill her. Get him in his plane and get him into New York. So that, and also Doc Savage's office is the 86th floor of the Empire State Building. Ah. So I wrote mm -hmm. this prologue, which is still one of my favorite things I've ever written, which is what every pulp hero is doing the night that Kong is rampaging through Manhattan. And the last character we see is Doc Savage is literally in his study reading a newspaper. Nice. And the buildings start shaking. And Monk <laughs> runs into the room and says, uh, come look out the window, because, wow. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Something really, we have lived pretty unusual lives, but the thing happening right now is pretty pretty wild so uh yeah the morning after kong i i did submit it to dynamite once and they couldn't quite it was right at the moment i think that street and smith and Condé Nast were pulling back all of the copyrights mm. uh, so that james patterson could write an absolutely terrible shadow novel <laughs> uh, oh well spears <laughs> these things uh. happen <laughs> <laughs> so uh let's talk about uh drawing blood real quick uh so this is obviously with Kevin Eastman, right? Yeah. Um, there is a page on there. First of all, clearly a documentary. So, which one of you is this? A, like, a, a, is this? Were you? Were you the criminal? Or no? Uh, they, there, there are as as Kevin likes to say, as much as it's you know thinly veiled autobiography. He's never been in a gunfight. <laughs> like that's not a thing that 
you know, it is highly fictionalized, but uh, there are elements of a lot of ridiculous things that we've both been through it. And it started 2015, I met Kevin at Emerald City and we hit it off right away, became very good friends. And then he asked me to look at this thing that he'd been working on since 2005 called uh, On the Shoulders of Giants. And he literally said to me, it's a terrible title. It's how I look at my comic book career come up with a better title. Job one, come up with a better title. Uh, and we were at San Diego and I was walking him to a signing from the Bayfront Hotel to uh, the IDW booth, I think. And as we're walking along, I was like, That's a, I, need a, I need metaphorical things that connect, connect cartooning to pain and suffering. Mm -hmm. And I came up with Drawing Blood and he's like, that's it, that's the title, we'll, we'll run with that. So, uh, but yeah, it, it it started out as entirely his thing. Obviously, when he hired me to write it, uh, it's as I can't say it's as much my autobiography as his, but it's got a lot of aspects that uh, that I brought to it. My favorite example is people, you know, people are obsessed with what's the true story. You sure. will not find the true story in that book. It's so, so this is just completely. There's no inspiration. There's no real oh, there's life gangster. A lot of, there's a lot of inspiration. Okay. Uh, the the character who gets the easiest uh, one to the character who's closest to reality is the film director Morgan Harbor. Mm. Uh, some of the things that come out of Morgan Harbor's mouth are actual things a certain person said in public, <laughs> and they were too good for me not to use. I'm like, I can't make that funnier than it was in the real world. Now that one, are you yeah. able to name that certain person? I think, uh, <laughs> you know, in order to build a harbor, you need a certain physical uh, landscape aspect. Okay. You build, oh, you build okay. a harbor in a... Uh, a lake, a <laughs> coast. Uh, a coast. Uh, uh, no, no, it's pass. It's in, pass. In that, <laughs> it's in, in, in a coast. River Phoenix. You're talking, River Phoenix. Yeah, <laughs> you're talking about River Phoenix. River Phoenix. <laughs> so now, yeah. after this, we're just gonna be, we're just gonna put our heads together. I think it's pretty easy <laughs> to figure out who Kevin Eastman might think of as a big budget director who did something. But, uh, but yeah. So some of the stuff. Hey, hey. Some of the stuff, <laughs> some of the stuff in the is directly. <laughs> got it. Got it. And one of the ways, one, one of the things that we did with the Kickstarter campaign is we sort of we presented it as though Shane Bookman was a real person, nice. whose career overlapped with. Kevin a little bit and that we're all friends and all that and uh, to that end I mean I'm sure you saw we wrote in a cameo by Kevin and I'm there and Ben Bishop is there Kevin's wife Courtney's in the panel mm -hmm. they passed Kevin Eastman on the way into uh, a panel a convention panel and my favorite thing is when the Morgan Harbor guy walks up and sees <laughs> Kevin Eastman he says is that who I think it was and Shane Bookman says yes and he says, fuck uh, that guy and fuck his fucking turtle. <laughs> <laughs> and that may be my favorite line of dialogue I've ever put in a comic book. Especially That's in awesome. one, especially That's in awesome. one you know, co-plotted with Kevin Eastman uh, that I was able to. Uh... But yeah, so it's, uh, awesome. it's for all that it's based in reality. My favorite example to give is that, you know, everybody wants dirt on Kevin's relationship with Peter Laird. Mm. Obviously, I know some of it. Obviously, I've heard stories I can't repeat. But the character in Drawing Blood is named Paul Bookman, and he's Shane Bookman's brother, because I think that's a more interesting you know, relationship, making them brothers instead of just buddies and roommates. And really, what I'm putting into it is my shitty relationship with my sister. It has very little to do with Peter Laird. You know what I mean? It's a bunch of people that are reading into it. Yeah. yeah, the drama in those two in that relationship is the drama between me and my sister. It is not really based on anything. Not Kevin and Peter. Not God. really Kevin and Peter. <laughs> and if anyone if anyone wants to see our uh, interview, our last interview with Kevin Eastman, you can kind of click here. Does that do it? Is that going to do it, Riva? Well, now <laughs> I have to. Yeah. And now you have to. Okay. <laughs> and, and then wait, let me do it again. Let me do it again. And then you can see our first. And second oh, interview with awesome. Kevin Eastman as well. <laughs> I saw that you guys had talked to Kevin. Yep, yep. Good, for the, the third one, he's um, a, he's a, he. I always say he's the second nicest guy in comics, and that's only because Stan Sakai is supernaturally nice. 
Hell I, would, be yeah, I, would, I would agree. Out of everybody, you know, I can't really think of anybody who we didn't like talking to, but some people just come off as like just naturally. Uh, it's not for the camera. It's just, yeah, Kevin just is, you know. Kevin yeah, just, is genuinely kind. Yeah. He's a sweetheart. Yeah. He really so speaking is. of the turtles, one thing that I was that I did notice, um, and I don't know if it's an Easter egg or if I'm just reading too much into it, but in Drawing Blood, there's this filmmaker lady uh, who's doing a documentary in issue one. And she is that is that April O'Neil? Is it she has a yellow coat? I mean the the yellow coat is April O'Neil. Okay. Uh, Kevin but, and then she's not April O'Neil, but I'm saying she was like exactly like Easter yeah, egg. Is the, that for me the, to go, ooh? There are so many I'm a big if you're if you're reading anything I wrote and you're like you ask yourself is that an Easter egg the answer is always yes. Okay. Uh, every every everything comes from somewhere. Uh, whether it's an Easter egg that you would notice or whether it's something from my life, that's something. But uh, to be fair, three... if I was a writer, I would just say that anyway because it would yeah. make me look a lot smarter than I. Then there's that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> see, see, I'm the opposite. If I was a writer, that character would have been like. April Obeil, and I would have been like, <laughs> get it? Get it, guys? <laughs> there, were, there were actually three things going on with that character. One is that as a plot element, Kevin spent a year being followed around by a couple of uh, Canadian filmmakers. They made a movie called Turtle Power. With consent, right? Uh, <laughs> what's that? He had, they had consent to follow him around. Oh, yes, they had consent. Because <laughs> okay. uh, that's not how it sounded. I was like, oh my God, that sounds terrifying. Were, <laughs> Neither of them were attractive redheads, but uh, <laughs> I the book I didn't want the book to be all dudes, so I made one of them a woman. And then during the Kickstarter, we ran a thing where we would use your face on a character if you gave us X amount of money. And a okay. good friend of mine actually uh, paid for it. And you know, our intention was to just put it on the face on an extra or a small, a very small part. But when we were designing the comic, I was like, you know, my friend Gretchen, who gave us the money for that level, is actually a very attractive young woman. We need a face for a very attractive young woman on Gretchen, on, on the <laughs> yes. character who was not at the time named Gretchen. I think she was named Julianne or something like that. I wish, I wish like, it could have been my face. That would have been, <laughs> been awesome. I, I don't. I think we left out with Gretchen. There was a guy who was <laughs> There was a guy who had paid to have himself and his toddler in Drawing Blood. And then he saw the first issue of Drawing Blood and he's like, uh, I don't think I can show anything like this to my kid. What made and, him think? Well, he, <laughs> it wasn't done yet. Like he yeah, had right. no idea how R rated it was going to be. Yeah. Was yeah. like, we'll, we'll put him in the, we'll put you and your kid in the rag dolls. And that will, that worked out just fine. That's wow. perfect. That's perfect. He's now awesome. walking down the street with his kid. In on the streets of Queen, uh, in a panel on ragdolls. But yeah, there's, you know, everything needs to come from somewhere. So you strip mine your past and your, and I always say writers are just gigantic score settlers. There it you, is. You piss yeah. us off. We're gonna use your name for a bad guy for twenty <laughs> fucking years, and we're not gonna even blink doing it. That's um, so awesome. That's so awesome. There's a guy who sued me about five years ago. No, longer than that, ten years. Stop. Ago, Did he win? Lost. Oh, okay. Badly. And his name has shown up on three villains in comics. <laughs> <laughs> like, so guy. you're saying like, if we piss you off, we can get famous? Is that what you're oh, saying? Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it goes, it goes the other. Kind of famous, but, yeah. It goes the other way too, though, because uh, as oh, Judah yeah. Rad, as as Judah Rad, I was kind of shocked to see when uh, Jack Kirby kind of took my last name for uh, Norman Rad, the Silver Surfer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so. Um, so we, our friends uh, over at Not Near Men, we watched your interview over there. And one of the things that I remember you talking about was that, you know, you have uh, Elvira, the beautiful Elvira, the beautiful Betty Page. And you were saying along the lines of like, oh, I didn't really want to be known for that. Uh, mm -hmm. But I picked up those deals. Um, a, a genre or a story or a pitch. Where, where do you want to go uh, in the future if you can pick your next project? Well, the project that I'm pitching right now, and I've talked about it a few times publicly, uh, is based on something from my childhood. Um, my dad was a World War II veteran and a Pulp Fiction novelist himself. And this is a 100% true story. When he told me fairy tales, you know, bedtime stories when I was a kid, 
for whatever reason, he made them all into World War II combat stories about himself. Oh, nice. Wow. Uh, you know that thing, the Hollywood thing of like when you're pitching something, you always choose like two super popular things that it's like. My favorite thing is to do that, but you choose two super popular things that it's almost unthinkable to try and put together. So when I pitch this to people, I say, it's the Princess Bride meets Saving Private Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> and like, try to, try to work that out in your head as to what uh, kind of a thing that would be. But yeah, awesome. I, that sounds did, awesome, by the way. I did an, thank <laughs> yeah. you. I did an eight-page version of the Hansel and Gretel story called German Chocolate last year for something called nightmare theater anthology really good horror anthology we did on kickstarter and i when i took when they said do you have anything i said if you don't mind i'm going to do an eight page pilot for a series i've been wanting to do forever uh and they were like sure great and i got the amazing sylvia calafano to draw it um who was perfect for the gig it's amazing how many of my favorite artists i went to friends of mine with the proposal and they were all like oh man i don't want drugs thanks <laughs> <laughs> world war tier gear and uniforms and all the detail yeah and when i was looking around for who would be good for this i was like wait sylvia calafano has to get starfleet technology right on every single goddamn page world war ii will be a walk in the park oh yeah <laughs> compared <laughs> to the starship enterprise and phasers and communicators right and, Simons and all like and likenesses of Shatner and Nimoy. And like, she actually will get to draw faces that aren't, you know, from bubblegum cards. So, uh, so she did an amazing job and I'm hoping to keep uh, her on board with it. And, you know, we have an, another four issues of uh, Drawing Blood that will be, the, the boys are drawing issues five through nine now. And I'm writing 10, 11, nine, one. 9, 10, 11, 12, yeah. So uh, that's still going to go on. And and Kevin and I are also working on uh, another project of his uh, from his vaults that he wanted me uh, to work on. And I'm still sort of, <laughs> he has about a decade's worth of sketches that he's done and that another artist has done. And it's literally like he couldn't, he had to like mail me a hard drive. It wasn't something he could send by email. Uh, so it was a lot of stuff to pour through, but it's kind of a post-apocalyptic escape from New York kind of a thing uh, that we're working on together. But I have no, I have no shortage of stuff, <laughs> you know, and I'm happy there are, and I, there are any number of characters I would love to write. I mean, I, I always kind of whisper at panels that, Honestly, I'd rather I'd rather write Zorro than Batman. Uh, <laughs> but I also would like to make a living. Yeah. So if someone offered me Batman, I would be thrilled out of my mind. How about uh, Batman that's... money with the Zorro story? Yeah. Oh, How about Batman Zorro? <laughs> what about what about Batman meets the three little pigs? <laughs> oh damn. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I actually I pitched Dynamite. Uh, I said, reach out to DC Comics because I think I think Elvira should meet Swamp Thing next. Ooh, I think that yes. is an irresistible freaking comic. That and writes so, itself. And I would set yeah. it in I would set it in the middle of Alan Moore's American Gothic run. <laughs> wow. Oh wow. Because I really just want to write a comic book where Elvira refers to John Constantine as Sting on every goddamn page. I, think that really <laughs> that, I don't know what Sting Alan... here is telling you, but you know, I think that'd be I think that would be so goddamn funny. The Alan Moore uh, era could definitely use like a little dose of like lighthearted joy, little, and also a little little satire. Hmm. Little right. satire. You know, we always have Elvira breaking the front, the fourth wall. So on page one, I would probably write interminable poetry about the swamp, and then have Elvira say. Oh my God! Shut up! What is wrong with you? Yes. <laughs> Who wants to read this dense poetry about the swamp on page one of a comic book? Can we just, can we get it going? Yeah. And I say that with all the love in the world for Alan Moore, but I go back and look at some of those issues now, and I'm like, oh, I'm so tired. <laughs> what? You don't like sexual assault and depression? That's my favorite. Well, there is that. <laughs> right. there, there, there are those are there's those are two big things for Alan. But yeah. <laughs> That leads me into my final and most important question, which is 
which superhero is the best at giving head? That's a good question. I'd oh, like to think that Superman question. has the greatest control over every muscle in his body. <laughs> and his tongue is never going to get tired. <laughs> true. That's true. Lois is screaming her head off. And he's like, I can just keep, I can do this as long as All I day. <laughs> the endurance. That, yeah. wow, that's true. That's he's true. Right. He's never going to get tired of what he's doing. He's never going to, you know, and he's also giving. You but know, Galactus... He's but Galactus has no gag reflex. What so is your What that. is your thing for you, Galactus? Yeah, that's your <laughs> that's you head cannon Galactus for you. So bad. Yeah. Galactus has, I, has has no gag reflex, but you also have to be enormous. Yeah. Or his mouth yeah. believe that. Well, like, well, let me tell you. Body. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Funny you say that. <laughs> Galactus gave me head. No, literally his entire head. Yeah. Uh, sucked yeah. on my planets yeah okay. yeah but uh <laughs> but yeah i'm gonna i'm of 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 your traditional super well i'm gonna code a sill to that that's the best male superhero at yes but diana 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 oh, growing up on that wait. island with nothing but women for her entire life I, oh, okay I, okay 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 yeah 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 so kind of lingus yeah. i'm thinking like I feel like the Diana, the other kind of head. I don't think she'd be very. You don't think she's a sword that. swallower? Again, she's no. again she's giving. You know. Yeah, like, she is I, giving, but she, uh, like you said she grew up with women, so yeah, you know, there's yeah. a certain level of practice. That yeah, it also depends. Like you know, are we are are is this right off the boat from the island, or is this having been in man's world for? Three? Oh, that's fair. Okay, that's fair. That's right. It's a good. It's a good question. Yeah, 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 this conversation. He figured that out. Yeah. I think he figured that out pretty pretty fast. <laughs> Yeah, um, no, that was that was good. Uh, so I'm glad we settled we, that. Yeah, we we decided, uh, and by we I mean Re, uh, decided we were going to ask that, and uh, we just weren't sure how that was going to go. So we're like, hey, I, it, we, 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 like, it is, is not easy perfect? to make me blush. Okay, <laughs> excellent. I was uh, well, we definitely appreciate uh, <laughs> we appreciate the answer, ladies, <laughs> gentlemen, and envies. That is the end of our show, <laughs> David Avalon. Thank you so much for uh, for joining My us. Pleasure. Thanks for having thank me. Thank you. On absolutely hey everybody out there uh shit's not over and i've said that before but like now for real like for realsies it's not over uh go get vaccinated wash your hands wear your mask and let's uh let's let's ride this thing out it's what Uh, superman would want you to do it's what superman would want you to do uh with all of his endurance and excellent control as much there might be a little something (laughs) something in it for you too (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Uh, we're out of here bye Peace. peace If you want to hear interviews from industry pros, get first looks, and have access to endless comic content, wake up. Please wake up. You're in a coma. Your mother misses you.